Any questions or comments about anything you've heard, anything that's on your mind? This is the time to get the Borg brain of Libertopia at work on your problems. Are you uh, coming for a question? Are we rolling? Okay, yeah, I actually have a question for Stefan. Um, is this loud enough? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you know, back to what you were saying about, you know, Ron Paul or, you know, or whatever, comparing it to, uh, to what's it called? Um, to, you know, gov jobs created by government that, you know, you get, it's, it's the unseen. Couldn't the same thing be said about any other per prominent person in the liberty movement that they potentially have the, or they have the, the you know, they could potentially alienate any other given person based on their personal views. For instance, you talk a lot about atheism and you're very critical of people, of religious people. Couldn't religious people also say, oh, well, these anarchists, these libertarians, they're just a bunch of heathen, you know, atheists. I, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Right. So how is that different from Ron Paul being, you know, not disbelieving in evolution or being a Christian? Or, right. Uh, I'll just repeat that. Uh, so the, the question is that I say that people may be turned off libertarianism because of Ron Paul's religiosity, but I, as an outspoken atheist, may also be driving people away from the movement because of my criticisms of religiosity. Well, um, I, that certainly is a valid criticism, and I, I accept it, but I think that the difference is that uh, evolution is, is, is true, right? And so, uh, if you're going to be alienated, then you should be alienated for correct positions rather than incorrect positions. And uh, so, I, I think that we can't, like, Philosophy is not a popularity contest. In fact, if you're a popular philosopher, you're, you're not doing it right. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. If you're a popular philosopher, then you're Paul Krugman sucking at the state titty of power or something like that, right? So, so you don't want to be popular as a philosopher. If you're not accused of corrupting the youth, you're just not fulfilling the pledge of office, right? So, so I think that you don't want to modify your positions according to who it may uh, keep or drive away from a particular thing that you want to do, but you always want to follow reason and evidence as much as possible. I think that Ron Paul has not much excuse to reject evolution given his training, but again, I think it's a challenge that he faces in the political process, so I think it's okay to alienate people as long as you're right, if that, if that helps at all. All right, so another question. We've got lineups Can here. Can I barge in and interrupt? Yes, please. <laughs> um, lots of people who've been on my list for many years say, do you believe in God and what's your religion? And I'm glad they don't know. And occasionally I talk about it in private, but the reason I do it that way is because to me, what people say is their religion doesn't matter to me in the slightest because I know lots of people who wear the label of, of Christian or Jew or Muslim and they advocate violence against me. In which case, okay, you say you believe in a guy who said, you know, do unto others as you would have done unto you, and then you advocate that I be robbed. Uh, to me, religious belief, what most people say, doesn't matter. If they will leave me alone, and I will leave them alone, that's the only belief I care about. And I think, I think it's tempting, it's tempting but irrational for people out there to say, well, you don't believe in a God, so I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. Um, but I think, for me, the best way to get around that is, you know, when we're talking about, let's do away with a giant mythical beast called government, None of the rest of the stuff matters. If you believe a giant pink armadillo made the universe, if you believe the Christian God, if you, whatever you believe in, I don't care if you'll leave me alone. Um, sort of along the lines of what Ernie was saying, doesn't make any difference to me. It's sort of like saying, do you like vanilla or chocolate? Who cares? I'm in uh, much the same way. I. Uh, I'm not what I would call a, a high church atheist, as some of, my, some of my dear friends are. I am very much of an agnostic. Um, I, in, in religion as well as everything else, and particularly in the realm of politics, uh, if somebody has any kind of a belief system about anything, I don't care what it is, I don't care if it's your preferences in terms of art styles or music or whatever, uh, I have kind of an agnostic attitude. I'm going to take a look at it, I want to examine it, I want to see whether or not there's uh, any evidence, whether or not there's uh, anything that kind of comports with my inner sense that, yeah, that must, that must be right. Uh, I happen, on the, on the evolution question, I happen to think that's the best explanation going. Certainly a hell of a lot better than the idea that there's somebody sitting up uh, someplace uh, designing all this stuff. Uh, if it was designing it, I tend to think, tend to agree with uh, Arthur Kessler, who said that uh, mankind is probably something of a, 
of a biological freak, you know, that we ended up uh, probably evolving too quickly, that uh, our reptilian side uh, got uh, developed into a more rational side uh, uh, in ways in which our, our, our brain just doesn't quite work the way, you know, the way it should. It's like giving a killer ape intelligence may not have been a sound evolutionary move, but evolution nonetheless, I think, is, strikes me as, uh, as more plausible. Uh, and I agree with Larkin that he, you know, it's a question of, of preferences. I think we all have a need for what I call small r religious or small s spiritual experiences, a need to transcend our own experiences, our need to connect up with the universe in some way. I also agree with Carl Jung, one of my favorite uh, people, who said that uh, a church is probably the last place you're going to satisfy spiritual needs. Uh, I have no use for organized religions uh, or organized much of, uh, of anything else. So. Let me just, uh, I just very briefly mention something too, because I always come back to the kids, <laughs> which is that um, the religion uh, is not something that people arrive at through um, through empirical evidence or through reason. Uh, in religion is something that is taught to children. It's true. I mean, that's and I, I don't consider that I, it's not valid for me to teach my daughter that anarchism is true, or that libertarianism is true, or that the free market is the best system, or the non-aggression principle is valid, because those are all conclusions. My goal, of course, is to teach her how to think. And maybe she'll find a way to prove the existence of a deity to me, in which case I will worship both her and the deity. But um, I, I don't have the right to teach conclusions to my daughter. I think that is harmful to her intellectual development. And my concern, of course, is, is that with religion, people don't just pop out as adults, as religious, right? That they're instructed on these things that are true. And very often, though not always the case, they're instructed that there are negative consequences in the extreme, like an eternity of hellfire, if they don't do X, Y, and Z. That seems to me entirely too threatening an approach to teaching the child about something, and I think that we need to let our children just reason the way, teach them how to think, not what to think. And I think if that approach is taken, I'm not sure how long religion would last, and that's my concern about it. It's not the adults who can believe whatever they want, it's the children who are not free to develop their own beliefs because they are, uh, a, a very heavy weight is laid upon them uh, at a very early age about things for which there are no evidence. I, I like what Larkin had said that it doesn't, it shouldn't matter. What I would point out is not necessarily alienate somebody because if we would alienate people who are religious, do we discount someone like Isaac Newton, who was a very religious man and created an entire system of mathematics or calculus? So I suggest we remain skeptical and we investigate and we look for evidence, but to discount or alienate people strictly on what we believe is, you know, that they were religious or what we believe, but, you know, some of their thoughts that were, were maybe they were delusional. We, we would lose a whole lot of, of art. We lose a lot of mathematics. We lose, in fact, the computer screens that we look at with somebody, you know, by a religious boy from Idaho who did, you know, Philo Farnsworth. So we, we don't completely discount or alienate people just because they may have a religious background. I think if someone is trying to force the religion on you, that's a different story regardless of what it is. But it shouldn't matter so much. We're all here for freedom, we love life, we love liberty, and that's what it should be. So if we're going to alienate anybody, it should be somebody who doesn't love life and is trying to aggress against us. Ready next question? Yeah. I want to direct a question to you, Stefan. You said, <clears throat> you said that the root of all evil is child abuse. Now, I've taught developmental psychology, and I've taught forensic psychology, and that is not what research psychology suggests. Um, <clears throat> Robert Hare, the leading expert on psychopathy, believes that there is a genetic influence on uh, psychopathy, or what some people call uh, uh, the sociopath. And uh, certainly the psychopaths and sociopaths uh, could certainly be considered evil. And not all of them come from dysfunctional abusive families. And Robert Hare, the leading expert, believes there is a genetic influence. And in developmental psychology, uh, it, there is no suggestion <clears throat> that the only, or for that matter, in psychology in general, we never talk about the cause of any complex human behavior. There are multiple causes. 
So I think that that is a bit of a hyperbole at best. And I, I agree, and that's a good point to clarify. Uh, I said that the, the root of evil is child abuse. I certainly don't mean to say that uh, anybody who acts in a destructive way uh, was automatically and, and so on, and that there's no... It's not a one correlation, and that's a great point to bring up. People who have brain tumors can have significantly affected personalities uh, just as a result of brain damage or people who receive brain damage. And the experts that I've had, and I'm not going to obviously question your expertise because you're the expert and I'm not, but there seems to be, um, the question is some people who go through terrible childhoods end up as very good people, and some people uh, may be the other way. There seems to be something around this, this epigenetics thing, that there are certain genes that are turned on and off dependent upon childhood experiences. So some people who don't have latent aggression uh, in their gene pool, so to speak, uh, who then uh, experience negative experiences as children, they don't end up that way. And other people, it may go the other way. So yeah, I, I, I personally think it's a huge majority, but it's certainly not an absolute one-to-one -one majority, and I appreciate you bringing that up. All right, I've got a difficult question that's been bugging me. Uh, so we've... For who? That's been bothering me. No, but who are you uh, asking? Um, I guess you, but it, it could go into Everyone, the okay. general population. I'll let other people answer, then I'll come back. Um, so, we, we've achieved the end of the state, and we, we've passed that point, and now we have uh, these uh, dispute resolution organizations that act as our insurance and our private security and our private military, but now they've got the guns, so what protects us from them? It's, I don't think I've, I've felt like I've got a really good answer on, on that, and, it, and it's been bothering me. So, you know, what, what stops them from instituting their currency now? And, uh, you know, tax farms are very lucrative. Tax jurisdictions can bring a lot of money, and now they're not uh, instituted by and of and for the people, but it could be more like a junta or something like that, and then warring warlords. And how, I, I just, that, that's just something that's just been bothering me. I just want to hear your opinion. Can I have this one? <laughs> the ability to use violence will always exist. And as demonstrated, um, the ability for some nasty people and the, their, their willingness to attack others will always be there. The difference is, right now, I compare the number of people who individually, without the myth of the state, will on their own feel justified in trying to rob me. It's not very many. So far, it's never happened. As it happens, I have a gun in case it ever does happen. The number of people who advocate that I be robbed because they believe in the state is about 300 million in this country. It'd be 6 billion if once we get world government. So, the, don't underestimate the gigantic factor of perceived legitimacy of the attack and the robbery. Like when people say, well, without the state, a gang could come along and do that. Can you imagine a gang of 100,000 people robbing 200 million people? That's what the IRS does. And the only reason it works is because the victims hallucinate legitimacy. I guarantee you, if tomorrow nobody imagined the IRS had the right to do it, the IRS wouldn't be there the next day. I think there's another question that needs to be asked, and that is, why, why is the state uh, suddenly, and I mean this within the past 10, 15 years, suddenly resorting to such draconian measures of violence, of, of you know, in, in surveillance of every little thing that we do, of, of groping us at uh, airports, and now they've even taken to, uh, TSA is now at work uh, at the state level, uh, stopping traffic to see if you might be a terrorist and so forth. Uh, wars that are conducted just on the whim of whoever happens to be in power and so forth. Why, why is this all going on? I suspect that the reason that it's going on is because the political establishment, the owners, as Noam Chomsky calls them, and I think that's probably as good a term as any, political establishment knows the game is about over. The world is becoming very decentralized. Uh, people just don't uh, approve of this stuff. They're not drawn to it the way they used to be. Um, and, and, and I think there's, a, I think what they're really fighting for is not so much a war on terror as much as it's a war to preserve the foundations of the institutional order. The, the vertical, pyramidal, top-down model is going. And it's not, it's not going out of any sense of 
you know, intellectual development. It's not that people are suddenly sitting around reading wonderful books. It's kind of in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union didn't collapse because suddenly a lot of intellectuals in Moscow are reading Ayn Rand. <laughs> so, oh my goodness, you know that uh, we're violating in some particular basic premise? No, I didn't know that. Well, hell, let's bring this thing down. <laughs> it just didn't work anymore. And here it's just not working anymore, and the owners know it. And so the question is, what do we do in the short run? I think, I think in the long run, I'm very optimistic in the long run. In the short run, it's going to be very, very ugly. It's always very ugly when you're dealing with a bunch of thugs. And uh, I, I think it becomes a question of, there is an important question, how do you protect yourself from the thugs? I'll just give you a very quick, uh, this is a, there's a free book on my website called Practical Anarchy. I go into this in more detail, whether you accept it or not, at least that's a resource. Uh, economics drives the fact that you can't get a particular defense agency springing into a statehood because uh, you, have to, uh, you have to provide your defense services as cheaply as possible and effectively as possible to compete with, right? So let's say Butler Co. is your, you know, making a pledge saying, hey, I'm going to protect you. And, you know, Steph Bot Incorporated, well, I'm not incorporated because we're in a free society, but Steph Bot Defense Agency, yeah, limited partnership, I'm making the same pledge. Well, we're going to want to give you the best price possible uh, to protect you from some sort of coercion. And the only way we're going to do that if, is if we're not amassing a secret army of black helicopters and sharks with laser beams and stuff like that to take over as far as the state goes. Or if so, if you sign some contract with me, you're obviously going to want reassurances that I'm not going to go and build up some army of robot attack killer mice or something, right? And so you're going to have me independently audited and make sure that I'm not hiding any weapons. That's going to be part of your protection and I'm going to put a $10 million reward to, to anyone who finds I buy one bullet more than I pledge is necessary for your defense and all that. So. Uh, and the, the last thing, of course, is let's say we engage in this contract and then I suddenly want to start building some robot army from hell. Well, I'm going to have to find the money for that somewhere, right? So I'm going to have to raise your rates. And you're going to say, well, why are you doubling my rates? It's like, well, uh, no reason. Uh, no reason. I just, you know, I feel like I need some more money. Well, you're suddenly going to go to this guy who's not building up a secret army. So the economics, remember, price signals enormous amounts of information in a free market. So if I want to build some robot army, I have to find the money. I've got to borrow it, which means I've got to pay interest, which means I've got to raise your rates. Uh, also, I'm going to have to put huge orders into weapons manufacturers. That's going to be another big red flag. Like, there's going to be so many ways that that's going to be maintained and controlled because the price signal and the contract and the concerns in general that the population is going to have is going to make that impossible. If I took that to a board, right, saying, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to start providing services that are really good and really cheap and we're going to just try and take over everybody with this massive military mechanism, people would say, are you crazy? <laughs> I mean, that's just, we're not going to do that. We're just going to keep providing good services at a reasonable price. So it just, that's a real brief thing but I hope that helps. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I would just like to comment on what you, what Larkin mentioned yesterday. Once you get to a voluntary society, and like what Butler was talking about, the vertical structure of society is gone. People don't accept the program anymore. They just, it, it, like you mentioned, we're not going to go back to a flat earth or where the, the earth is the center of the universe. It's just people won't accept the program anymore. So how do you take over? Yeah, there's going to be violence, but there's going to be, like you're saying, there's going to be organizations and businesses to take care of that. But they're not going to accept the program anymore. So it really is not something that can happen. Yeah, we have three, three, ten minutes to three questions, so we'll keep it brief. Sorry, go ahead. Well, this is a comment about electoral politics. I was involved with the Libertarian Party at the beginning and was the first national secretary and resigned in a couple of months because I saw that this cause was not going to lead to the desired effect. And it was years before I realized John Galt refused political power even under torture. Right, and yet Ayn Rand was very keen on the political approach. So. Yes, now the, I, want to make, I want to comment on what you said. You seem to in, is, believe that there is inevitable progress. There have been dark ages. And the famous ones weren't the only ones. There was one after the Trojan War, for example. Uh, and it can happen again. Yeah, I definitely believe that it's up to us. I mean, that there's no historical movements. And it, there is going to be a dark age unless we stand up against it. I think there's no question of that. This is primarily for Butler, because I've heard him speak on this in the past. Um, I expect oh, he rest you, of course. No, the, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is actually... He wants a short answer. Yeah. Yeah. They, the... Um, there's a theme with these uh, largely socialist occupier types that there is no right to the means of production held by the people who currently own it. 
what what really is the origin of property and where do we where do we get off saying that's my car Oh, that's too 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 deep a subject. Not too deep, too long a subject to respond in what two and a half minutes. Not even uh, yeah, not even that. Uh, I dealt with that in my book, uh, Boundaries of Order. I brought brought a few copies with me, for interest, and you also can find it online at uh, Mises. But basically, a uh, property is something that derives from our relationship with each other. Uh, I respect you. Uh, I respect you for what you claim, or you respect me for uh, whatever it is I claim, uh, simply as a way of survival. And uh, beyond that, uh, every political system, every political system, is a war against property. Every single one. Every political system is socialistic. Uh, because it claims a collective interest in the state, in controlling whatever it is you own, particularly yourself. So. Uh, Stick around at a break, and we'll, we'll chat about that one. See, he, uh, he already owns your time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I guess uh, my last question, I might end off on an on a unhappy note, maybe, but uh, I want to know why uh, the most principled people seem to uh, trap themselves into a state of perpetual discontent with the state of society and the the emerged order because it, it seems that like uh, a couple of years ago if I voted in California for Prop 19 to tax and regulate marijuana you know people would come to me and say well that's a statist position you know that there shouldn't be taxation or regulation so my question is is that as uh, as an anarcho-capitalist or as a you know the, the you know the purest uh, sense of the ideology of individual freedom how do you find happiness in, in the world that you're, that you're in if it's perpetually the state, the state, all right. the time? Well, I think that genetically we are mutants. I mean, there's no question of that. We are the X-Men, just, you know, without all the cool physical powers, just the intellectual ones. I think that this is, I can't prove this, it's just a theory, so toss it out if you don't find it useful. But I think that going against the tribe throughout most of human history would just get you killed. And so I think that we have a very strong desire for acceptance. And ostracism was one of the most common punishments in Asian tribes, as, as also David Friedman was talking about here as well. And so we don't like to go against the general tribal beliefs. I think just, it's, it's hard. And I think you have to, I think that's a good thing to accept. Because otherwise you feel like, well, I guess I just don't have enough integrity because I find this hard. Uh, I think it is hard. And I think that but re the reality is that all human progress is going against the grain. Because uh, no matter how good the grain is, it, get os it gets ossified. It goes against new situations, new environments, new ideas, new technology, new beliefs. And so I think to recognize that what we're doing is a hard path. It's an uphill climb. And, uh, and it's going to take a long time. Uh, I think that it's all the more heroic because it's early in the development of, of the true non-aggression principle and property rights. Uh, and I think find like-minded people that you can connect with. I mean, doesn't everyone feel really normal here? I mean, isn't that nice? We were just talking about this at dinner last night, you know? Like, I'm not sitting there when somebody says, you know, Obama's going to, you know, turn, turn the moon into cheese and we can all eat forever. Uh, you don't have to sort of go, all the time with people here. You're like, I don't believe like that. Yeah, what kind of cheese? Yeah, you will like cheese. That will be in order. No, so I, I think find like-minded people. Find a community uh, of, of people that you can really share and grow your ideas with. Because we don't have to find people who disagree with us. That's blaring at us all the time. Every time we turn on the TV or the radio or talk to a muggle, I mean, it's just the way that it goes, right? So I think that just recognize that it is an uphill climb, but that there is heroism in it, and to remember that to not be a slave to, to ideology or philosophy or anything like that, to take time to enjoy the, the beauty of the world, the, 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 the physical exercise, the music, uh, dance, whatever it is that uh, gets your groove on, really take time to enjoy that. And uh, you know, remember, there's a time to lift the sword, and there's a time to put the sword away. I can totally relate to your question, um, because it's I think a lot of us are, you know, some of us are predisposed to, we want to fix the world. Like, plenty of people seem just fine with, well, if my neighbor's being stomped on, hey, as long as it's not me. And it bothers a lot. It bothers me that there is this much injustice in the world. And sometimes it's hard to, to be able to step away and be happy when you know that, you know, millions of people are being tortured and, and oppressed and, and everything else. And so it's sort of a balance that I think without, without that bothering, if it didn't bother any of us that other people are being oppressed, we would just run away and find a way to hide. So I think the bothering in one sense is good, 
Um, but yeah, sometimes it's a struggle to not be depressed and psychotic because the scale of the evil going on is so gigantic. And I won't pretend to be an expert on not being depressed by that because it's hit me several times. But there has to be a balance. We have to be bothered by evil or nobody's ever going to change it, but we have to be able to be happy and not go insane when trying to push against an evil that's gigantic. Yeah, and I, I think that intellectuals have largely been the main group responsible for the belief that somehow there's something wonderful and great and civilizing and everything else about intellectualism. Uh, it's their, you know, it's their means, of, means of survival. And I've always, I've always thought that the intellectual pursuits have always been a very mixed one for humanity. Uh, we've had wonderfully creative people in the sciences and the arts and philosophy and literature as it's come out of uh, the creation of the minds of very creative people. We've also had all of the destructive systems. We've had uh, you know, the political philosophies. We've had uh, the religious tyrannies and so forth that have also been created by intellectuals who figured out this is a clever way in which I can control other human beings. I can't go out and manufacture steel or whatever it is I might, other people are doing in the, in the marketplace, but I can at least uh, have a comfortable living for myself by figuring out systems and creating systems by which I can control other people. And I think this is where we need to question the, the whole process of intellectualism, which really begins with us. Really begins with us. Who, who can you think of? Who can you think of that can do a better job of running your life than you can? I appreciate that. And I, what I do is, and I had a, a, a problem too. I mean, I didn't go to jail like you did for this, but you know, I, I have a family also. Of course, my wonderful wife is here and my, our kids. And it comes down to, uh, you know, yes, to be bothered, but to have such deep-seated anger that the world isn't the way we would like to see it. So we may talk about nonviolence, but when we have that deep-seated anger that, damn it, they shouldn't be aggressing against us, that's violence in us. And if we don't examine our own lives, if we don't root out the violence within us, and we can't expect to have any kind of change in the world. So it goes back, again, we're working on ourselves. And I like what Gary had mentioned yesterday about you know, friendships and actually being friends with people, not trying to proselyte and get numbers. Oh, we've got, if we have to, this is, this is a peaceful evolution. This is something that only we can do, you as individuals. Like we mentioned yesterday, there is no group. This is the myth of the group. It's all individuals. So we have to examine ourselves and be the change that we want to see. If we want a truly non-violent society, then we have to root out the violence in ourselves. And I don't remember who said it, but it's great. I don't love liberty so much that I would want to force it on somebody else. So it comes down to if we want a truly voluntary free society, we have to examine what kind of violence we may have and excise that from us, and then the world will respond to us in a much more positive, non-violent way. And remember, don't fall into the trap of becoming unappealing to yourself, even, right? I mean, because one of the things that evil does is it makes you frustrated, and it makes you embittered, and it makes you angry, and it makes you depressed. And then people say, well, is, is, is that what freedom looks like? I don't think I really want to bite of that crap cake over there, right? So remember that you have to remain happy within yourself. And I don't mean sort of like paint on a smile and, you know, do a song and dance while the world goes to hell. Uh, I just mean that recognize that we are all just pushing a tiny little bit. And we are in a time of plague. We have a pill that everyone thinks gives them the plague, but it actually takes them away. And sometimes we can give it to them orally and sometimes... Anyway, I'll show you later, maybe. But, um, but just remember, just stay happy within yourself uh, as best as you can and recognize that we're all just part of this, this great fight. Uh, it's a noble pursuit. Uh, we're not probably going to win in our lifetime, but there is extreme honor uh, in the pursuit of that. And everything that we have that is great in this world, equality for women, rights for children, uh, some vestiges of the free market was all created by people like us who did not succumb to bitterness. I'm not saying love your enemy. I'm just saying love the truth and what it can bring to you and don't end up being so unappealing that you're like a big sign saying, freedom, don't go here. <laughs> Just a, a one sentence response to that. Um, pay attention to the man who I've always considered to be the uh, sort of the father of modern libertarian thinking. That was Leonard Reed. And Leonard Reed said, uh, to, be the, to be the person that your thinking and your philosophy represents. 
be that person. And I would just say, don't try to be something. And I would just say, I'm going to disagree. I'm going to say, yeah. well, we, well, not with you. I, no, <laughs> not with you. But I'm going to disagree with what you mentioned about love the, your enemy. I would say that what we're trying to cultivate, and the reason why we're here, and question why we're here, I'm here because I love liberty, and I think that life and liberty are, are one. That's why I do this. I love life. Life is the most precious thing that we have. And I believe that what we want to do, what we're trying to do, is cultivate empathy. And that we want to have empathy for people. Because if you can't have empathy for the worst of society, I'm where sorry, it's difficult... I, I, just, I think you may have misheard. I didn't say love your enemy. I said love your enema, which is the second <laughs> way that we get that pill into people. With that, we'll take a break. Thank you very much. Remember, tickets are available at Sovereign Lunch. If you want to continue the conversation, show us your ticket. We might talk to you. Thank you so much for your attention. Great questions, everybody. We will see you back here at 2, but we got some bands coming up now. Is that right? All right. Are they